First produced to instant and lasting success in 1897, Edmond Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac has been filmed several times, most recently and most successfully with Gérard Depardieu in 1990, and has been constantly revived in the theatre, including a season also in 1990 starring Jean-Paul Belmondo. Serrano was recently voted France's favourite literary character, beating Jean Valjean and D'Artagnan by a considerable margin. So, what is it all about? Serrano is heroic, although anti-heroic at times, tragic, spirited and ebullient, but above all else he is human and shows human failings as well as strengths. At the time of the setting of the piece, 1640 to 1655, patronage was the norm. Writers, actors or musicians all required a patron to ensure success. There was no system of national grants, benefit or welfare. If success required funding, one had to find a benefactor, usually a wealthy individual who may well expect some kind of payment in return. At least, this is Serrano's fear. Fiercely independent and insisting on the freedom to do, say and think whatever he pleases, Serrano rejects the very idea of patronage since it would come at too great a price. The principal themes of poetry, or the expressive arts in general, independence and love are intertwined, with each integral to the other, and so it is virtually impossible to discuss one without reference to the others. As a work of art and a tribute to the beauty and glory of poetry and the arts, it is only fitting that Serrano should itself be in the form of a poem, an extended poem whose rhymes, apart from being pleasing to the ear, allow and facilitate the elaboration of feelings and emotions and the connection of ideas, allowing language and ideas to flow and run into one another by means of association of words and sounds. Serrano is clearly devoted to poetry and the beauty and clarity of expression it engenders. He interrupts Montfleury as he embarks on Cloris at the start of our play because he thinks Montfleury is an awful actor who delivers lines badly and because he thinks a play itself is worth less than naught. His devotion to words will not allow him to listen to what he considers poor quality poetry. When Valver tries to insult him and Serrano embarks on the famous tirade du nez, it is to give a lesson in wit and wordsmithing to someone he considers inferior and who should learn how to express himself before embarking on such a task as to try to belittle a wordsmith like Serrano. Later on, when de Guiche offers him patronage and the opportunity to have his work corrected by none other than Cardinal Richelieu, Serrano refuses point blank, not only because of the implied loss of independence, but because of his pride and belief in his own work. When Serrano helps Christian write letters to Roxanne, it is not simply to help Christian achieve his purpose. Serrano is immensely proud of the beauty and clarity contained in these letters. They contain his feelings, his thoughts and his soul. The letters are his gift of himself to Roxanne. Serrano's insistence on independence can be seen on a number of occasions, most notably at the start when he interrupts the performance of Cloris, showing confidence in his own abilities and judgment, and his unwillingness to bow to position and reputation. He is willing to take on and argue with the entire assembly, including members of the Académie Française who are present, and of course de Guiche, whose protégé Valver somewhat unwisely challenges Serrano to a verbal duel. Serrano justifies his actions, giving reasons for his dislike of both the play and the principal actor, showing to what extent he's a free spirit and thinker. Later on, when de Guiche offers Serrano his own patronage, Serrano launches into a speech listing his reasons why he would never accept such an offer, listing the advantages of moral freedom and the freedom to express himself as and when he pleases. Serrano displays great strength of spirit and independence in terms of courage, skill with the sword and in his literary work. However, love and a total lack of confidence in his physical appeal to women leave him open to self-doubt and he finds himself embroiled in a scheme to win the attentions of his beloved Roxanne for the attractive but dim-witted Christian. 
therefore losing a great deal of his independence, which he is willing to lose if it leads to Roxanne's happiness. Love is seen in several shapes and forms in the play. Valver is interested in Roxanne because he sees her as a means of social advancement, being both beautiful and considered witty and charming. De Guiche, although married to a relative of Richelieu, would happily see Valver and Roxanne together so he might ply his influence and embark on a sexual relationship with Roxanne. With Christian, the attraction is mainly physical, though Roxanne would like to believe there is more to it, and even loses interest in Christian when she feels he may not be as bright as she anticipated. Serrano's love for Roxanne is perhaps a purist. Spiritual love and respect for her character, charm and wit. However, Roxanne clearly feels the need of both the physical and the spiritual, so Serrano feels inadequate and sets about making Roxanne happy by helping Christian fulfil her requirements. It's interesting to note that Christian and Serrano both feel inadequate and indeed form one complete being when they work together, Christian being the physical and Serrano the spiritual. Separated, each half is insufficient but together they are one. Yet, in the long term, Roxanne discovers that what is important and what touches the heart is a spiritual. Serrano loves Roxanne to the point where he is willing to sacrifice his own happiness and fulfilment. He gains satisfaction from knowing that the words and sentiments in Christian's letters, which mean so much to Roxanne, are his own. The play is beautifully crafted, combining drama, tragedy and comedy. Rostand manages to combine entertainment with emotion and touches the heart of his readers and viewers. However, even at the time of its first production, Serrano's place as a valued piece of literature was challenged. Personally, I find it vastly entertaining, touching and beautifully constructed but I do find it very specific to Serrano and his particular circumstances and problems. Although feelings of unreciprocated love will be familiar to readers, the very wit and ebullience which we find so attractive in Serrano are also quite intimidating and perhaps distancing. We feel we can never attain his standard of wit nor his level of devotion to Roxanne. Somehow Serrano's story offers no solutions to similar problems that we may have. Great literature contains imagery and inspirational stories which are pertinent to our own lives. They give us food for thought or even guidance. Personally, although I find Serrano admirable, touching and entertaining, I find it difficult to see its relevance to others' lives in terms of guidance or solutions to life's problems, especially as the character traits we find so admirable can be seen as contributing to the tragedy of the piece. As for the Depardieu film, written and directed by Jean-Paul Rapineau, I thought it was a superb rendering of the original. I thought all the actors played their parts beautifully, especially Depardieu and Weber, but the sets, costumes and of course the music by Jean-Claude Petit all made a significant and essential contribution to the overall success of the film. In 1990, Jean-Paul Belmondo starred in a revival of the play in Paris at the Marigny Theatre, directed by Robert Ossin. I was in France at the time, and I've always regretted not making the effort to go and see him in it. However, I did manage to obtain a DVD of the show, which has forced me into reviewing my perception of the Depardieu film. In the film, Serrano often appears curt and angry. He is independent to the point of being unapproachable, even unfriendly. Then there are times when he swings from anger to something bordering on self-pity, in manner, if not in words. As a result of watching the theatre version, I became more aware of the speed and manner of delivery of all the actors involved, though especially Depardieu. While his delivery is ebullient and attractive in its own way, His style tends to accentuate the rhyme and rhythm of the words, rather than the words themselves. I also came to think that the cinema version overplays, perhaps, the period richness and detail. While it is sumptuous and beautiful to the eye, I now see that it may detract from the story itself. Curiously, I have never been especially moved by Serrano's death scene in the film, though others clearly found it profoundly moving. 
I've always felt it was laboured, over-directed, overplayed and focused too much on Serrano himself, while the others, particularly Roxanne, are also affected by the tragic revelation at the end. I might also say that while I admired and sympathised with Serrano, I'm not sure I ever really warmed to him exactly because there always seemed to be a lack of warmth and compassion in him. In the theatre version, Serrano seems more human. He is less driven by anger and perhaps as a result of this we become more aware of the theme of independence and individual strength. Here we have a more controlled performance with slower delivery. The film's running time is 2 hours 15 minutes compared to the 3 hour theatre version. As a result of which the lines have greater impact while the resultant altered emphasis develops the impression of character and humanity. These elements are aided by the simpler theatrical presentation, adding intensity to scenes which are perhaps ill-served by the flamboyance of the film. Opposite Belmondo, in the role of the lovely and intelligent Roxanne, we have Beatrice Agenin, whose confidence and experience add much to the part and make her character more thoughtful and attractive than the younger and at times flighty Roxanne of the film. I have to say I feel a sense of guilt and disloyalty as I thoroughly enjoyed the film and it has so much to commend it. In the end, however, I wonder if its weaknesses are due simply to the fact that Serrano belongs to the theatre and the medium of cinema brings with it certain demands which do not serve Rostand's tale as well as the medium of the theatre. Perhaps because it's such a wordy piece, Serrano is seen in the film as almost constantly on the move except when talking of his feelings or talking to Roxanne. While this emphasises his energy and dynamism, it also has the effect of accentuating apparent anger and tetchiness while diminishing calm and reason. Of course, this works well when we first meet Serrano and he virtually bursts onto the screen, but it can become a little wearing as it persists throughout the film. My thanks for taking the time to watch this video presentation. I hope you find it of some value.